from the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. This is Rendezvous with History, a podcast that captures the drama of presidential decision-making. Dr. Anthony Eames sits down with prominent scholars and leading citizens to bring to life what happens in the White House and how it shapes the world. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. Welcome to Rendezvous with History. My name is Anthony Eames, and I'm so pleased to be joined here today by Dr. Ben Steele, Senior Fellow and Director of International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations, and importantly for our episode today, the author of The World That Wasn't, Henry Wallace and the Fate of the American Century, available on Amazon and anywhere else you may procure books. Um, Ben, so great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Anthony. So, um, you know, this is a really detailed, really interesting history about, as you put out, the world that wasn't a counterfactual of what might have been. Um, like any good podcast, we like to kind of get in the author's head and ask, you know, why did you want to write this book? <laughs> you know, um, yeah. what what drove you to write uh, what looks to be, uh, I don't know, 500 or so pages on Henry Wallace? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting story. When I was writing my, my previous book, which was an historical narrative on the Marshall Plan, I had made um, a number of pilgrimages up to Yale. Uh, to meet with uh, John Lewis Gaddis, the Cold War historian, to discuss in particular George Cannon, who was a sig significant player in the creation and implementation of the Marshall Plan. And over the course of our discussions, we um, got to talking about what I might do next. And um, he strongly suggested that I should consider writing a, a biography of Henry Wallace, which I thought was ridiculous at the time. I have a PhD in financial economics, uh, I thought the Marshall Plan was um, a significant enough move away from uh, that, uh, that, that that background, but um, um, he was quite insistent, and over the course of three years, was still urging me to to consider it. And the reason was that um, uh, Oliver Stone, back in 2012, had made uh, what. Uh, he he would call a documentary called The Untold History of the United States, in which he argued that uh, Henry Wallace had kept his rightful place on the Democratic ticket in 1944. Of course, he would have gone on to be president at Roosevelt's death in April of 1945, and there would have been no Cold War. And um, uh, Gaddis was really um, quite disturbed by the fact that many of his um, smart, articulate, educated undergrads were quite taken with this idea that the Cold War was un unnecessary, uh, and that Henry Wallace was therefore an exceptionally important figure in American history. And he felt that somebody should really dig a little more deeply into, into this, um, uh, a lot of aspects of Wallace's career that he considered important. He knew that I had um, successfully mined the, the Russian archives to do my Marshall Plan research, and, and we both wondered whether there might be some good stuff in the Russian archives about uh, Wallace. Um, so fast forward to my completion of the Marshall Plan book, we're talking now in 2018 or so, and I decided, you know, this could be an exciting project. I had found tidbits about Wallace in my research on the, on the Marshall Plan, so I thought there might be something there to be mined, but I had no idea how remarkable the, the, the finds would be. And this is not a book I could write today, given that the, these archives are effectively closed to Russian, Russian to uh, Western researchers since the uh, invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Well, we're glad you were able to get to those archives when you did. Um, it's a, a, you know, it, Henry Wallace, as you pointed out, wasn't your kind of first choice of topics to write book, but but you were clearly <laughs> persuaded. But looking at his early career, his upbringing, um, you know, where he got his start and what he became known for, seems like having a degree in international economics actually might be pretty beneficial uh, for, for writing this book. Can you tell me a little bit about Henry Wallace in those early years before his kind of rise to political stardom? Right. So Wallace was born in 1888 in um, a very 
small village out about five miles outside of Orient, which is itself about um, 64 miles southwest of um, Des Moines. Um, he came from a relatively modest background, although his grandfather did um, in his youth when uh, Wallace was um, uh, about seven, um, go on to create uh, what became an extremely influential farm journal called Wallace's Farmer. And this was during a period of American history where about 40% of the U.S. population was involved in farming. So it's a big deal. It was sort of what Barron's was to Wall Street in the 1980s, you know. Um, uh, this became an exceptionally um, uh, influential publication and a very profitable one under Wallace's father, who took over editorship of the journal in 1916. Wallace's father then went on to be agriculture secretary under um, Harding and uh, Coolidge. Wallace himself then took over edit editorship of the journal and was in his own right, by the time we get into the 1920s, already a, a pretty serious um, agricultural geneticist. He began exper experimenting in his teens with hybridizing corn, producing superior strains of, of corn. And he was so successful with his experiments that most of the corn we eat today, not just in the United States, but around the world, is a result of Wallace's experiments in hybridization. So fast forward now to 1932, and FDR is running for president. Um, and he's looking for someone who will, you know, help him with radical experiments to bail out the, the farm sector. Um, and it was pretty natural that Wallace's name would come onto his um, radar. He is by this time part of, you know, the Iowan agricultural aristocracy. He has a, a name as someone very knowledgeable um, in this area. And Wallace also was a very much a free thinker, which is something that um, FDR uh, admired. So on paper, at least, he was a logical choice as a cabinet secretary. Get into that free thinking. I mean, you've laid out all the reasons why Henry Wallace makes a good fit for Ag Secretary, FDR's administration, of course, filled that role from, I believe, 1933 to 40. Um, some really strange things go on yeah. uh, in those early years and his tenure in, in Secretary of Agriculture, specifically some connections, as you point out, to um, basically a Russian mystic and artist with a with an international reputation. Why don't you tell me a little bit about those kind of strange connections and perhaps free thinking taken to the extreme <laughs> right. in Wallace's case. So uh, while Wallace was pursuing very radical reforms in American agriculture, for example, um, ordering the premature slaughter of six million hogs as a way of limiting supply and raising um, prices, um, he was also uh, freelancing with his mystical and occult interests. Um, Wallace had long had an um, uh, interest in the occult and theosophy. And in 1927, uh, um, a Soviet agronomist introduced him to uh, the work of um, a Russian artist, emigre artist named Nicholas Rerick. Um, and a museum had been built um, with his name uh, in New York City. And Wallace went to visit it in 1927, and he becomes transfixed before a Tibetan uh, prayer mat in the lobby. And from that experience, he develops a, a deep uh, abiding relationship, not only with Rerick, but with um, the so-called inner circle of the museum. Now, Rerick was not only an artist of some renown, but he, he was um, uh, um, a, a mystic. His wife had created a movement called Agni Yoga, um, through which she claimed to receive divine wisdom from the um, uh, ancient Himalayan uh, Mahatmas. In other words, she, she at times claimed that God himself was speaking to her directly, and she would pass this on to her disciples. Now, fast forward to 1933, Henry Wallace's uh, agriculture secretary 
Um, the traditional story about what went on is that um, Wallace appointed Rarick to lead a seed foraging expedition in Central Asia to find drought-resistant seeds because Rarick was supposedly an authority on the um, um, uh, area. And this, the, um, the, the expedition all goes wrong when Rarick um, engages in some activities that aren't related to seeds, they're related to uh, politics and theology, and poor, naive Henry Wallace gets caught up in this. Well, the Russian archives tell a very, very different story. Wallace was, uh, in fact, fully aware that Rarick was looking to create a new theocratic state in Central um, Asia that would encompass territory from Siberia, from uh, Mongolia and Manchuria, and was looking to to aid um, this uh, ambition. But he did it under the guise of a seed foraging expedition. He really misled Congress. Um, and as you can imagine, when Rarick gets to Central Asia, he's a messianic figure and he's trying to convert people to his ideas. He creates huge diplomatic problems. Um, the Soviets suspect he's up to no good. The Japanese intelligence suspects he's a no good. Certainly the Chinese don't want him uh, um, uh, around. And a huge diplomatic scandal uh, breaks out in the spring of um, 1934 when a series of articles are published about this mission. Now, it turns out that a number of the claims in the article were incorrect and cer almost certainly planted by Soviet intelligence to embarrass the U.S. administration and get them to end the um, the uh, foraging expedition, and that, that's exactly what happens. Wallace uh, becomes humiliated and tries to disassociate himself entirely from the expedition. He claims that he never knew that it was involved in, in um, uh, politics um, at all and seeks to disband it. What's um, particularly fascinating about this story is that even FDR gets caught up in, in it. Um, FDR um, certainly did not participate in any of these um, uh, political um, uh, ambitions, but he was fascinated with mysticism in, himself and was not at all disturbed by the fact that Rarick was a, was a um, uh, mystic. But when Wallace turns against him in late 1934, um, uh, FDR actually part participates in influence, influencing um, Sam Rosenman, who had been um, a, a lawyer and um, uh, integrally part of his, in, of his administration in New York when he was governor, influencing um, uh, Rosenman as a state Supreme Court justice in a court case um, in which a financier named Lewis Horch took over the museum from um, Rarick and the trustees. Wallace himself got the IRS on to Nicholas Rurik and assured that he could never return to the country. So it was a rather stunning story uh, about Wallace's fascination with um, theosophy and the occult and how he almost created you know, World War II several years early. Okay, so you just laid out for us, Wallace has a lot of political baggage. <laughs> um, this connection with Russian, uh, Russian mystic, you know, this diplomatic crisis, essentially, uh, in, in Asia. How do you get to a guy with this much political baggage, this much scandal, being someone worth putting on the ticket, the presidential ticket yeah. as VP uh, in, in 1940? I mean, what what is the appeal to FDR and how does that all play out in 1940? Well, FDR didn't understand how deeply Wallace was associated with the Rarick venture, and really how deeply Wallace had become embedded in a cult. But he was going to find out in 1940. So in 1940, um, you know, FDR is contemplating running for a, a third term. Um, he decides that if he's going to do so, the party's going to have to draft him. He's not going to put his name forward. Um, and he's going to be quite insistent that he gets to choose his own VP. He doesn't want to compromise with the party anymore. He'd spent 
um, two terms with John Ann Garner, a uh, sexist conservative as his vice president. He wanted to choose his own man. Now, a, a lot of people who are relatively expert in the period think that Wallace was FDR's first choice. He was not. Um, FDR's first choice by most accounts, credible accounts, was Cordell Hall, the, the um, Secretary of State. His second choice was another relative conservative, Southern conservative, Jimmy Burns, from Senator Burns from um, South Carolina. Um, Cordell Hall didn't want the job. Um, Jimmy Burns was seen as being a political liability because he had been a lapsed Catholic. Um, he married a Protestant, and it was assumed that he would um, hurt the Catholic vote. Um, at this point, FDR is still determined to find an internationalist to have on the ticket because he knows he's preparing the country for the possibility of, of war. And in that regard, Wallace fit the bill. Um, Wallace was also still a very dedicated, forthright, vociferous New Dealer at a time when um, FDR couldn't shepherd the New Deal himself. He had to move on to more important issues in foreign affairs. And so Wallace was looked at as being politically valuable in this regard. And then finally, he was from a farm state, and FDR thought that would help in the um, farm belt. Um, in the end, Wallace was not very politically useful to him. Um, first of all, the Rarick scandal reared its ugly head. As you know, the so-called guru letters uh, came out during the campaign. The Republican Party got hold of these really embarrassing um, slavish um, uh, letters that Wallace had written to his dear guru, Nicholas Rarick, and his um, uh, wife, and they, they threatened to publish it, publish these letters. Um, in the end, FDR managed to prevent this by threatening to go public on Wendell Wilkie's um, uh, affair at the time. So there was a, a ceasefire, and the guru letters um, lay untouched um, <laughs> for uh, a, another uh, eight years, but they would reemerge in 1948. Um, but Wallace um, didn't actually help um, uh, FDR at all in the farm states. Wendell Wilkie only won 10 states in 1940, but seven of them were in the farm belt, and one of them was uh, Wallace's home state of Iowa. So, you know, by this time, Wallace is seen as being um, uh, somewhat of a fringe player, um, a, a dedicated progressive who's off the, the democratic um, mainstream and is no longer seeing as, seen as someone with the cultural sensitivities to deal with um, uh, the farm belt of, uh, effectively. So that should have been a warning to FDR. Well, I suppose it's good to know that... Uh no matter the time in American history, things were still pretty down and dirty in, in politics in Washington, D.C. Uh, well, you know, it's striking. You kind of lay out Wallace isn't FDR's top pick for VP. He's not particularly helpful on the campaign. Uh, one of the reasons why FDR doesn't get his top pick for VP, as you point out, is the vice president isn't that great of a position in, in exactly. 19. 40. Um, I suppose you could argue today some might feel that it's not that great of a position anymore. But certainly in 1940, it still retains that kind of ceremonial feel, that ceremonial responsibility uh, that it had had since the founding. And yet Wallace, despite this political baggage, despite his shortcomings as a, as a ticket mate with FDR in the 40 campaign, seems to start to kind of arrogate power to himself. Uh, from the position of vice president, doesn't isn't just a ceremonial vice president. Uh, how do you see Wallace really start to make that position something more than what it was? So um, the vice president only became formally part of the cabinet under Harding in the 1920s. Um, it really was, as you say, primarily a ceremonial post, which had two two main duties. One is to, as you know. Um, uh, resolve tie votes in the Senate. Um, and the other was to sit on presidential death watch. Um, and that aspect of the job, as you know, became incredibly important after the 1944 election. Um, uh, but in, in 1940, 
um, uh, again, the, 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 the job was mostly ceremonial, and Wallace performed it abysmally. He absolutely hated presiding in the Senate. Um, he hated senators. Um, John Nance Garner was quite popular with senators. He kept a well-stocked bar in his office, and um, he was constantly inviting senators of both parties um, over for convivialities to make sure those convivialities would never be interrupted. He installed a urinal in the corner of his uh, office. Wallace, as soon as he, he, he took the job, got rid of both the bar and the urinal, made himself extremely unpopular with um, Democratic senators. I get the uh, urinal, not which... so much. I could get rid of the <laughs> urinal seems like a good call. Um, but the junior senator from um, uh, Missouri, Harry, Harry Truman, was uh, not too happy with the, 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 the change. Um, but FDR um, appointed Wallace to head um, what eventually be became, it went through several acronyms, but the Bureau of Economic Warfare, um, which um, Wallace made into quite a powerful um, institution involved in wartime procurement. Now, this is quite typical of FDR. He would create these new uh, agencies and departments that would overlap and basically compete for control in a given area. And Wallace was in near constant conflict with other figures in the administration who were involved in procurement. The two main ones um, were Cordell Hall, the Secretary of, of, of State, um, who, as the, the man overlooking foreign policy, um, had a formal role in wartime procurement, but um, uh, in particular, Jesse Jones, the Commerce Secretary, um, who was an extremely powerful figure at the time, controlling not only com the um, um, Commerce Department, but the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, RFC, which was an enormous government um, piggy bank. And the two of them, Wallace and Jones, basically fought for two years straight in public, insulting each other um, um, in front of um, uh, Congress, in front of the public, in the media. It was really a, a complete circus. And given how important wartime procurement was, um, it is really remarkable that FDR let it go on as long as he did. The two main areas where Jones and Wallace fought um, were over Wallace's means of procurement. Wallace was willing to pay top dollar for everything to get as much as he could as quickly as he could. And that had a certain logic to it in wartime. But as Jones repeatedly tried to explain to Wallace, as soon as you signal to the, the world that you're willing to pay top dollar, guess what? The stocks of everything you need dry up as the holders of them hold the stuff back, trying to get more and more and more. Um, and then Wallace was all, also had an eye on the post-war world uh, and was really trying to reconfigure it in his image and imposing new labor and social standards on um, uh, purveyors of you know, rubber, for example, from Brazil. Um, and this infuriated Jones, who was um, a conservative and a very pragmatic one um, uh, at that. Um, and this went on, as I said, into 1943 until FDR finally decided he'd had enough. Um, and not only took Wallace out of that position, but abolished the Bureau of Economic Warfare and created a new acronym, the OFW, the Office of uh, uh, o, um, uh, OBW, Office of, uh, um, uh, of Economic War, OEW, Economic Warfare. <laughs> so many acronyms during this period under Leo Crowley. And so Wallace was really at that point sidelined in the um, uh, administration. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like OBW seems appropriate if you if you had an office for bureaucratic warfare, which <laughs> seems very much to kind of define the Roosevelt yeah. years in World War II. Uh, but you, as you kind of pointed out, this is a moment where we see Wallace's idealism be both his you know, kind of drive and energy to to become more powerful within an administration, then ultimately his his downfall. And I think there's a quote in the book at one point where you 
say something along the lines of once again, Wallace's mental map for reading the world is was detached from the realities of the world. Um, it's very interesting there. Um, you've just kind of led us into uh, political Siberia, if you will, uh, as if Wallace's kind of failure to win that fight against his rivals in the administration. And interestingly enough, as Wallace is going into political Siberia, he's also going to actual Siberia, <laughs> as you yes. point out in the book. Um, how does that that trip, that journey to Siberia set up the rest of his time in the FDR administration, subsequently the Truman administration, and then and then kind of the post-Truman years. And we'll get into further detail on each of those cases, but how does Siberia kind of portend things to come? So Wallace is a very volatile character, as you know, in terms of his political views. They can they change quite dramatically over the the decades. Um, in 1933, and no previous chronicler had really explained this very well, he fought virulently against um, FDR's proposal to recognize the Soviet Union um, diplomatically. Um, he argued to Roosevelt that um, their godlessness um, made it a danger for uh, Americans to have a deeper political or e even economic relationship with the Soviets. And previous chroniclers didn't really know what to make of this, but I discovered that this was because Nicholas Rerick, his guru, um, was very anti-Bolshevik at the time and, and um, uh, urged, ordered Wallace to take this position. Fast forward to the um, 1940s when Wallace is vice president and he becomes extremely pro-Soviet and makes um, many speeches pra praising the Soviet dedication to what he calls economic democracy. Um, he even praises um, uh, Stalin's experiments with um, agricultural collectivization. And by this time, it's pretty well known in the United States that millions of people died from this. And Wallace basically takes the position that, well, you need to break a few eggs to make an omelet. And this was, this was worthwhile in terms of producing economic progress in um, uh, the Soviet Union. So in March of 1944, he um, asked Roosevelt if he can go to um, Moscow. He wants to meet Stalin. He wants to get involved in foreign affairs. Um, if he's not going to be president himself next, he definitely wants to be for, uh, secretary of state. Um, Roosevelt will not let Wallace get nowhere near Moscow. Um, but um, oh, FDR had already decided to send Wallace as a personal emissary to, to China to meet with Chiang Kai-shek, try to get him to stop fighting with the Chinese communists and dedicate his military resources to fighting the Japanese. Um, and he comes up with this epiphany that, you know, given that de the DNC leaders, Democratic National Committee leaders, are urging him to get Wallace off the ticket, DNC leaders don't want to tell Wall, uh, FDR to his face, look, guy, you're, you're dying and you're not going to make it through a, a fourth term and we can't have Wallace as president. But they do convince him that Wallace is, is a political liability and he's fracturing the, the party. And Roosevelt decides in very Rooseveltian fashion that this might be a good way to get rid of him. He'll um, uh, let Wallace traipse through Siberia for four weeks before going to um, China. And Wallace does this. He spends four weeks um, basically being shepherded um, by Soviet um, intelligence and security figures um, through the Gulag Archipelago um, and either has no idea where he is um, or just doesn't want to know the truth. And there is some evidence that he did see elements of the, the truth and simply didn't write about it. He wrote a book about the glories of the Soviet accomplishments in Asia after um, his trip. It was co-written with a man named Andrew Steiger, who was a major a uh, NKGB jur uh, journalist source in the, in the United States. This book would ultimately become a huge embarrassment to uh, Wallace. And as you know, I recount in the book how the Soviets went to great, great lengths to produce this massive Potemkin continent for 
um, Wallace to tour. And this is late in the war, you know, when the country's been devastated and they're desperately poor, but they spent millions creating this Potemkin continent for um, uh, Wallace. And I have the um, accounts, um, not just of the Soviet fi officials about how they created each stage of this um, tour for Wallace, but accounts of the prisoners who afterwards w wrote about um, uh, their uh, embarrassing interactions with uh, Wallace, who thought that these people were, were just um, uh, uh, emigres, um, who, you know, who had moved from the um, western part of the country to Siberia to be great pilgrims. Um, like those who had moved west in the United States. Um, he had no clue what he was actually Well, Ben, seeing. this seems like a good warning to potential American political figures who may be visiting Russia during a Russian war and not to be so easily impressed with Potemkin villages and other displays of, of wealth and well-being. Well, as you, you know, the political spectrum is not always linear. Sometimes it's right, circular, right. and the far left can meet the far right. <laughs> you know, it's just one of these other instances in your book where we're reading about the 1940s, and wow, it sure seems like it has a lot of purchase and relevance for the events we're seeing today. Plenty more to dig into here, too, about how those that, that rhyming pattern of history. Um, but now we're into 45. Now we're into that, that period, that Oliver Stone period, where, oh my God, Henry Wallace should be president if he stays on the ticket for one more year, or, or one more cycle, I should say. 44, yeah. 1944 Democratic Convention. Wild. wild. Go ahead. It didn't have to be wild. Um, the DNC leaders did convince FDR that um, he should get himself a new vice president. But FDR, as you know, just couldn't bring himself to look Wallace in the eye and say, you're gone, my friend. It's over. Um, he hinted it pretty clearly. He sent emissaries to, to tell Wallace it was over. Um, he's not going to prevail at the convention. Um, FDR himself said, you know, I, I really want you as my running mate again, but, you know, they're going to beat you out if you go, go forward. And Wallace just kept insisting, as long as you want me, I'm, I'm all in. And so he went to the convention um, fighting for, for, to keep his, his job as vice president. FDR um, caused complete chaos by endorsing four separate people in four different ways. Um, one of whom was Wallace, but it was an absolutely backhanded endorsement, as you know. He wrote a, a letter to the convention chairman saying that, you know, if he were a delegate, he would vote for Henry Wallace, but he's n not a delegate, and who am I to dictate to the convention? In 1940, of course, FDR had told the convention, if you don't give me Henry Wallace, I will not accept the nomination. Now he's saying, who am I to dictate to the convention, um, and uh, made it clear enough that um, Harry Truman was, was the man. Um, he was definitely the favorite of the DNC um, leaders. He had all sorts of political attributes that made him desirable. You know, he was of the South, um, a, a border state, but he wasn't seen as being a product of the, the South. He's, he still got along well with civil rights leaders and, and labor leaders. Um, he was seen as be, being a, a, a very responsible um, choice. Um, he had performed very well as chairman of the so-called um, Truman Committee um, that um, uh, rooted out um, waste in uh, wartime uh, spending, um, made a name for himself um, that way. Uh, FDR didn't know him well, didn't have strong feelings about him, but th thought that was a, a responsible choice. And Truman won, as you know, on the, the second ballot. It was a pretty wild convention, uh, but it did ultimately go according to, to script. Um, and according to script, FDR did not make it through his um, uh, fourth term. He died in April of 1945. And so Harry Truman, 
rather than, ha uh, than Henry Wallace becomes president of the United States. And the, the rest, as they say, is, is history. A very, very different history than would have been written had Henry Wallace. But Henry become... Wallace doesn't see himself as done in, in history, does it? I mean, he really sees himself, Hardly. okay, he might have been, you know, pulled off the court and put on the bench. And as you point out, he's still put on the bench. He's still Secretary of Commerce. Oh, yeah, he's still very yeah. important to the, the Democratic <laughs> coalition. Um, one of FDR's first acts after the convention was to, to send Wallace a telegram and say, you know, I'm so proud of you for the fight you put up and you got to come to Washington and let's talk about your next job. Um, and FDR had that all scripted. Of course, um, Wallace wanted to be Secretary of State, but FDR said, I couldn't do that to Cordell Hull. He's such a poor dear. Um, but, you know, I'll tell you what, um, uh, you could have Jesse Jones's old job. And, well, you know how we both feel about Jesse Jones. And, and Wallace fell right into that trap. So FDR um, made uh, Wallace is Commerce Secretary basically to shore up his left flank with the, the liberals. Um, he tried to entice him into the job by saying, you know, you can get involved in all those foreign economic conferences and, and so on. I mean, there, there weren't any such things. So he got Wallace to believe that this would reconnect him with foreign affairs, but neither FDR nor Truman, who kept him on in the, the role, this, this despite um, not thinking particularly highly of uh, Henry Wallace, um, uh, did his best to, to keep him away from foreign policy. But as you know, he wouldn't keep Henry Wallace away from a microphone. And Wallace, um, throughout the year and a half he served under Truman, was constantly undermining Truman's foreign policy by making um, pro-Soviet and... Um, basically anti-administration speeches. So let's talk, I mean, you've kind of laid out, we, we have up to the end of FDR, basically, and, and the story is, it almost seems like Wallace is playing checkers and FDR is playing 3D chess, and everyone else around him seems to know that Wallace is somewhat of a, a, a useful idiot, almost, um, or maybe not almost, but is. Um, but let's get to the points where we see the onset of the Cold War, that moment that Oliver Stone says shouldn't have happened if Henry Wallace is president. And there's kind of, right. you know, there's many things that made the Cold War, but there's certainly kind of three legs to that stool that are important. The, the nuclear issue, trade issues, and the ideological competition. You kind of hit each one. Um, you hit the trade aspect, you hit the the, the nuclear aspect, and you hit the ideology. Why don't you take each of those in, in your kind of order of preference and, and tell us how Wallace approached so, those things. On trade, remember Wallace doesn't con control many levers of foreign policy at that point. Um, there are two things he can do. One is to make speeches, which he does. Um, and the, the, the second is to, to try to create deeper um, trade links with the Soviet Union. And basically, trade links at this point, um, 1945, 1946, are nil. Um, but Wallace and other um, players in the administration who are close to the Soviets, like Harry Dexter White, Wallace's friend at Treasury, who, as you probably know, was a, a, a Soviet um, asset, they are very enthusiastic about deeper trade relations with the Soviet Union. So their vision is that the, um, the U.S. Uh, will be able to offer the Soviet Union advanced manufacturing um, and construction goods in order to reconstruct the Soviet Union, and the Soviets will provide us with an enormous um, natural resources um, that we need um, in order to fuel our economy. Um, and the Soviets are, uh, Wallace creates this trade mission that he sends to Moscow in July of 1946 that he's very enthusiastic about. And um, his two trade negotiators come home completely empty-handed. The Soviets are just not interested. They make it clear to Wallace's men uh, 
um, that there are not going to be in any position to, to mine the sort of natural resources that the Americans um, all want um, without, without um, massive credits, loans from the United States. Uh, Wallace is all in favor of providing those massive loans. Harry Dexter White is arguing for $10 billion in loans. This is, it was well over $100 billion in t today's money, which is even more than the Soviets are asking for. But the State Department um, makes it clear to Moscow that uh, loans would be conditional on uh, cooperative Soviet behavior, particularly in, in um, Eastern Europe. And Stalin will have none of that. Um, and Wallace simply doesn't understand this, that um, the, Stalin is not going to let the United States develop political or economic relations with his new satellite nations, as he calls them, in Eastern Europe, and sends home Wallace's men completely empty-handed. So Wallace accomplishes absolutely nothing on the trade front. On the nuclear front, you know, this is really quite shocking story. Um, um, the U.S. Um, sets out in 1946 to create a framework for international control of nuclear energy through the new United Nations. Um, and Bernard Baruch is um, uh, named to be head of the new, new the U.S. delegation to the new um, Atomic Energy Commission at the um, UN. And um, so the U.S. plan is that the United States will agree to basically putting its weapons into escrow um, on a, a, um, a, a scaled basis as the Soviets allow um, international um, inspections of its own work in the nuclear area and that and the Soviets can document that they're not pursuing nuclear weapons. The Soviets reject any form of international inspection as a violation of um, uh, their sovereignty and completely misconstrue the um, U.S. policy quite deliberately, saying the Americans uh, um, uh, will dictate to the rest of the world what they're going to do with their weapons on, on what scale. And Wallace goes public um, stating the, the Soviet mischaracterization as actual U.S. policy and blasts it. Um, and I was really struck by Wallace's mischaracterization because it was so out of tune with what his government was doing. Uh, I, 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 it was shocking to me until I discovered the source of his information, which was an, an article in Pravda. Um, written in June of 1946. He was taking his own information about U.S. policy from Pravda. Um, and the man who was feeding him this information was his primary advisor at the Commerce Department, who was a longtime Soviet um, uh, agent named Harry Magdoff. Harry Magdoff was, um, was a, a member of the U.S. Communist Party, um, a, a direct agent for Moscow. He gave Moscow um, Wallace's most sensitive cabinet papers, his cabinet papers on atomic um, uh, affairs, um, which um, Wallace had um, used in September of 1945. Um, so Wallace was not just naive, but really irresponsibly um, uh, credulous at this point, taking his positions directly from um, uh, Moscow. So, I mean, these are some fascinating episodes of, uh, of Soviet agents really infiltrating the, the upper echelons of U.S. Uh, government bureaucracy specifically. I mean, Wallace really seems to be like the guy, um, uh, the, the kind of crown jewels of the Soviet espionage activities in the U S yeah. this, this does seem to kind of come out in 1948 to a little bit, uh, to a degree, um, really seems yeah. to undermine any realistic shot that Wallace believes he has in winning the presidency, um, from Truman and, and, and Dewey, as you, as you note, I mean, 
it's really a Dewey Truman race as as, as we all remember it. Um, but leading up to that, Wallace thinks it's a Truman Wallace Dewey race, uh, one of those mental maps that seem to be detached from reality. Narrate, if you will, kind of the story of the the nineteen forty eight election from Wallace's point of view, uh, as a kind of a nice sign off for 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 your book, the really wonderful yeah. book that everyone should check out who listens to the podcast. So um, Truman fires Wallace in September of 46 after a, a, a pro-Soviet anti-administration speech um, uh, before the pro-Soviet faithful at Madison Square Garden. Um, and Wallace at that point is determined to run for president. He just needs to decide whether he's going to challenge Truman within the Democratic Party, and he does seriously um, consider that or whether he becomes the leader of a, a new third party movement. Um, and, uh, you know, a really fascinating and enjoyable part of the story is reading about the machinations within the CPUSA, the American Communist Party, um, when they decide to create like a Potemkin party for, um, for Wallace. Um, they, they help create this new... Um, liberal front party called the Progressive Party, which just looks like a good uh, patriotic liberal party, but which is in fact controlled by the CPUSA. Um, and they decide that they're going to use Wallace as their vehicle to, to power. Um, they don't think Wallace is wholly reliable because he's no Marxist ideologue, but he knows that they know that Wallace follows the, the, the Soviet line religiously. Um, now, Wallace, I should emphasize, is not really sure he can win in 1948, but he's absolutely fine with the possibility of Dewey winning. Um, because then he believes that the, the country will sink back into depression and that he, Henry Wallace, will become the, the savior in 1952. Um, so he's got 1952 in his eyes uh, uh, as well. Um, and the, most, the most remarkable aspect of the campaign, as you know, is when Wallace colludes with Stalin. Really quite remarkable stuff. In the spring of 48, he approaches the Soviet UN ambassador, Andrei Gromyko, um, secretly uh, through the Czech UN ambassador, Vladimir Hudek. He delivers documents through, to Gromyko through Hudek. Now, he knows Gromyko, but he doesn't want anybody knowing that he's having these secret meetings with him. Uh, Gromyko, in his own uh, memoirs, uh, mentions many times that he met Wallace over the course of his career, but in 1948, nothing. Um, so they have at least three long meetings in which Gromyko is stunned to see Wallace saying that he wants to reach a grand agreement with Generalissimo Stalin to end the Cold War. And Gromyko says, well, what, what do you want to be in this agreement? And Wallace says, I don't care. Generalissimo can name, can name the issues. And Gromyko is just gobsmacked. How is this possible? But he keeps pressing Wallace, and Wallace doesn't care. Generalissimo Stalin can name them. And indeed, Stalin does, as you know, name the issues that um, uh, he wants in the agreement. Um, uh, Wallace wants to visit Moscow and meet with Stalin and come to their formal agreement in Moscow but it's Stalin is the more practical minded in this case and said that would be really bad optics. Um, so um, Stalin says a statement from Wallace would be fine and I'll endorse it, but let's not go forward with the meeting. So Wallace drafts what he calls this open letter to Stalin. Stalin sees drafts of it, writes his recommended edits on it, sends it back and Wallace reads this thing before the, the faithful again at Madison Square Garden in May of 1948 and a week later like clockwork as planned um, Stalin endorses it on um, Moscow radio. Now the State Department um, already has some pretty good ideas that there's some collusion going on they can't quite 
prove it yet. Um, but I did discover in the course of my research, not just this, the, this fascinating discussion with Stalin from the Soviet archives, but I found out in the U.S. archives that the FBI put agents into the printer shop that Wallace used to print up his um, uh, speech at Madison Square Garden. And they determined from the timing of the documents going in and out that Wallace had had advanced information for things the Soviets were going to say over Moscow radio, which basically pr proved the collusion. But by the time we get into late May, Wallace is sinking so far in the polls as the American public moves to the right and becomes distinctly anti-Soviet that the State Department just decides to let, let this guy hang himself, which he does. Um, Wallace just completely collapses uh, in the race and not only um, uh, fails to end it as a third party candidate, he's the fourth party candidate. He comes, uh, comes um, through with barely a million votes. Um, and actually gets fewer votes than uh, Dixiecrat segregationist Strom Thurmond. Um, and this, for all intents and purposes, ends And most Wallace's of those votes seem to come from career. New York, as you point out, the faithful at Madison Square Garden. Remarkable. Okay, so we've had a tale of VPs yeah. on death watch, FBI surveillance of presidential candidates, uh, collusion, with with the men in the Kremlin, and this is 1948, not 2016, 2023. <laughs> so just to be clear to the listeners, this is this is all the world that wasn't. Um, ben, one more time, this is a phenomenal book, the world that wasn't. Again, go pick it up on Amazon. Uh, your sign off. What are historians missing? What what archive or what research resource or uh, you know or or account that needs further fleshing out uh, needs to be investigated more by not just historians, as you point out, international economists, too. Well, uh, over, over time, uh, access to um, um, Russian um, uh, government documents has been more and more restricted. Um, but I, I think historians have underestimated how much was still available there, at least until February of 2022. And as, as you see from reading the book, it was remarkable how, uh, how much valuable information was, was there to be gleaned. You had to be persistent, um, but, it, but it, it, it was possible to learn an enormous amount about the dialectic between the United States and the Soviet Union at the beginning of the, the, the Cold War. And, you know, hopefully at some point, not too soon, um, it will be available again to Western researchers because um, really you can't have a good informed history of the early Cold War without access to these documents. But the, the, the second plug I'd like to make is for the FBI's archives, which are absolutely fabulous um, and were invaluable to me. Um, previous chroniclers of um, Wallace really didn't know how to deal with the pro-Soviet positions, um, uh, the um, positions uh, that were undermining Truman's efforts to produce industrial peace in 1946. Where did Wallace get these ideas? Um, well, it turns out that everybody under Wallace at Commerce uh, was having their phones tapped by the FBI. Um, and as I discovered, for good reasons, many of them were Soviet agents or at least major Soviet assets. And you could read the discussion discussions they were having in real time about what positions the secretary should take and how they were going to give him the information he needed to make those um, uh, statements. But without the FBI archives, a lot of the, what Wallace was doing was inexplicable. But with the archives, you really had a, 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 a front row seat into how policy was being made by, by Soviet agents. Well, once again, Ben, thank you for this absolutely revelatory account. And we can't wait for more people to read it and for the conversation to keep going. Have a good one, Ben. Thanks for having me.
Thank you. Rendezvous with History is a podcast produced by the Ronald Reagan Institute Scholarly Initiatives. You can learn more at ronaldreaganinstitute.org and follow along on social media at Reagan Institute.